Well, in your handout is, uh, or if you're at home, you can get this on your e-bulletin. I wrote this poem uh, several years ago and tried to put in poetic form, what does it, from the Bible and a, a lifetime of, of talking to men, what is God trying to do in the masculine soul? How is he trying to shape us? And so this is my one page, albeit very small font, um, that sort of sums up the big pictures of trying to understand what is God trying to do in my life? And so that's just a little extra for you. If you would take out your message outline for today, uh, we are talking about fathers. And uh, if you want the sermon in a sentence, uh, this is my summary. The father tells you what matters, why it matters, and shows you how to make it matter there is no substitute for presence. In a sentence, if I had to sum up what does it mean to be a father, this is what I'd say. A father tells you what matters, why it matters, and shows you how to make it matter. There is no substitute for presence. A lot of you know that when I was growing up, my father worked 14 or 15 hours a day. He went off to work in the morning about 7, uh, and 7.30 at the latest, came home 9.30 or 10 at night. And, and this just seemed normal to us. We, we didn't really know any better then as we were growing up, and we adored my dad, his personality, but we just really didn't see him that much during the week, and we weren't that engaged. He wasn't engaged at school and sports and, and uh, talks and the kinds of things that... Uh, but we didn't know any better at that time. We just, when he was home, he was home, and that was, that was great. Um, why did he work 14 or 15 hours a week? Well, if you asked him back then, during that time, he would have said, to provide for my family. Well, it turns out that he provided very, very well for his family. We grew up in an upper-middle-class home, of which uh, I was thankful for that. But it wasn't until... Uh, I went off to college that I began to realize why else he worked for 14 or 15 hours a, a day, Monday through Friday. And that was because of his mistress. His mistress demanded it. Now, I didn't know the name of the mistress until I was in college. Her name uh, had seven letters to it, and it started with the letter S. Success was his mistress. And he went there every week in search of that new... That that some kind of it that he thought would, would sort of fulfill his life and, and overcome that sense of emptiness and longing for importance in his life. Uh, and um, it, it failed miserably. It worked week by week. But over the long haul, there was a lot of things that were missed. And it wasn't until we were all out of the house that this, he realized this to his horror and spent about the last seven years of his life trying to make up for the previous 25. I remember him telling me along the line as, as I was uh, growing up that, you know, Seth, my father was, uh, was pretty distant. Uh, apparently he was a philanderer and uh, was not there very much. And he, and he would tell me, you know, I really don't know much about what it means to be a father. And again, at, in junior high level, I just sort of, I heard those words, but I didn't really catch the import of those until much later in life. Uh, what I began to realize as I uh, got into uh, married and having kids was that there was a large vacuum that had been created in my soul. And it was the vacuum of a distant father. A father who was just not there as much as I wish he had been. And who was, seemed to be more attracted to something else than to be me, my sister, my brother, and my mom. This really hit me when I got married. Uh, I was 26 years old, Mindy was 25, and uh, during, we had some great mentors in our life in grad school that uh, were tremendous help to us. But it wasn't until after I got married that I realized that there were so many things in being a young husband that I just did not know how to do. And I began to realize that a lot of these things were the kinds of things that you're supposed to pick up by watching your father do them as he related to your mother. 
And in some ways, I felt like I was, I was starting from virtual scratch because I had so rarely seen my father relate to my mother as a husband ought to, other than making sure he brought home a very good paycheck and took us on family vacations. Well, um, the, the, uh, what I missed, in, in, again, the, sentence, the sermon of sentences, is that what really mattered, um, I really didn't learn from my dad. He didn't tell me why the things that mattered should have mattered, and he certainly didn't show me how those things mattered. And I don't know if he would have been able to do that anyway, but his presence was, was certainly not a, a factor. If I, had, if I had to sum it up in a sense, I would say what I wish my father had done would have been to make a home. We lived in some really nice houses. I don't mean that. And really nice neighborhoods. I don't mean that. But that sense of home that was more than just what my mother by herself could do. And as I look back on that, what I really wish he could have done, and I've tried to do all of my adult life, is to be somebody who creates home, who builds home for his children. Well, uh, the question, uh, our title today is, Are Fathers Necessary? Uh, Dennis Prager did a little five-minute video on this uh, recently, and, um, and he said, up until recently, this would have been a question that would have been just sheer madness to ask. Almost like, is air necessary? Is water necessary? But over the last 50 years or so in our culture, the idea of manhood has been slowly dumbed down. And most of the time when you see it in sitcoms or movies or TV shows or stand-up comedians, uh, we as men look sort of like buffoons or, or goofballs uh, or just, just hopelessly out of touch with people and with life. In addition, what has gotten dumbed down in our culture for about the last 20 years is what parenting is. It appears to me that if you listen to our culture, what's really needed in parenting is to make sure your kids are provided for and provide them parental love. Now, obviously, those two are important things. But in our culture in the last 15 years or so, parental love is getting, is getting boiled down to maternal love. Or it's getting boiled down to, it really doesn't matter who the two people are, but it's good to have any two people love your children. And that's sort of how, where we are in our culture. Uh, in 2008, President Obama did a Father's Day speech, and he, I'd like to quote just a couple sentences. He said, fathers are critical to the foundation of each family. They are teachers and coaches, mentors and role models, they are examples of success and the men who constantly push us toward it. And he said, we all know these statistics. Five times, uh, children without, without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to uh, be incarcerated. Now, even though I had a very distant father, although he would never have said he was distant, but even though I had a, you know, somehow I evaded the, the 20 times more likely to do prison time and, and, and five times to, you know. But it still begs the question, what was missing? If I had a magic wand, what do I wish my father could have done during my growing up years? That's what we're going to look at here. Uh, in the book of Titus, uh, Paul's letter to Titus, who is uh, trying to get pastors in all different kinds of churches there on the island of Crete, in chapter 2, he tells five different groups of people who uh, or what to teach these five different groups of people. Older men, older women, younger men, uh, younger women, and bond slaves or servants. And our, our topic today has to do with older men. Now, older men back in those times, 2,000 years ago, was once you hit about 30, you were over the hill. You're on the downhill slide. When you're about 15, you were considered a young man and midlife crisis would have been about 27 or 28. So what does he say? Teach older men to be, and he tells them six things. Temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Uh, temperate means to have sound moral judgment. It's somebody who can read a situation and, and his antenna are good. 
and he, he, can, he can see what ought to be done and what shouldn't be done. Temperate. That's the idea. The second one, worthy of respect. And the idea here is somebody who's living an honorable life. They, they seek to, to rise above their natural instincts and, and to garner the, which garners the respect of the people behind them. Self-controlled, and the idea here is, is that men need to learn how to, to uh, rein in their passions and desires and not just go flying off by, by the, the things that, uh, that, tempt, that tempt us. Sound in faith, these, these last three have to do with the word sound, like sound in faith, sound in love, sound in endurance. And sound uh, means uh, healthy or whole. Uh, if, if you've ever done a will, uh, I, Seth Gatchel, being of sound mind and body. Both of those are getting a little shaky. <laughs> but you get the idea. There's something healthy or whole there. For all three of these things, what does sound and faith mean? Well, sound and faith means it, not just that I believe the right things or I, or I have the right creed. I know the right theology. But that, that it's, it's a man who, who relates well to God. He knows how to relate to God. He knows, he knows about himself and his weaknesses and his need for God and his need to be a better man than he is. And, and, and he's working on that. Second one is sound in love. And this is the Greek word agape, which is sacrificial love. And the idea here is a man who, as he lives his life, his antenna are telling him in whatever situation he's in, like a birthday party at a park. What does it mean to love the people that I'm with today? Or that I'm talking to today? That's just how this man thinks. This is what drives him. He's sound in love. And then sound in endurance, the Greek word is hupomone, which means uh, patient endurance or cheerful endurance or hopeful endurance, any of those things. And the idea here is that what he tells, he tells the older men he said, no matter how discouraged you get, don't give up. No matter how discouraged you get as a husband or as a father or in your job or your work or with your finances or with your health, do not give up. Do not give up. Now, why are these things important? Well, they're obviously good character traits for anybody. Older women, younger men, uh, younger women, servants, and but what he's saying here is, is important. There are people that need to see these six qualities in a man. What does it look like manifested or lived out? And there is a sermon for each one of these things as this kind of man lives out these particular qualities. That is different than how these qualities are manifested in a woman or through a woman. When I think about this, I think, what's it, when I think about it in my own life, I think, I, I think about some men I know who are like this and who have been like this to me. And I think it's a wonder to be able to relate to them. There's a sense of wonder about being informally mentored by some, formally mentored by a few, and certainly whose example compels me, like signposts on a road, to keep Moving in this direction. There's something here about fatherhood. The second aspect of character has to do with uh, relationships, and particularly, I think, about marriage. Uh, the New Testament tells husbands uh, two big things. Love your wife sacrificially and learn how to be tender with her. Both of these things are important, and, uh, and they are not intuitive. In my opinion, they certainly were not intuitive to me, when I was a newlywed, nor most young men that I talk to as they get married. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her. Now, so far in our almost 43 years, I've never been called upon to meet the intruder at the door who has a gun to sacrifice myself for Mindy. But there is not a day that goes by where there are elements and opportunities for me to sacrifice for my girl. And oftentimes, that's just by finding her when I come home and plopping down and saying, how was your day? And listening as if this is the most important thing any human being has ever heard. And what am I sacrificing? I'm sacrificing some time. 
Sometimes I'm, I'm sacrificing. I would just like to get away from people and just be alone for a few minutes. I'm about half extrovert and half introvert. And sometimes my extrovert thing is going. <laughs> sometimes I walk in that room and I'm already just kind of limping through, you know, trailing this, this, the latest discouragements in my life behind me. Uh, is that what's most important at that moment? No. This kind of man lives for something higher than that. Um, Ephesians 5.28, husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. No man ever hates his own body, but he feeds it and nourishes it, as, as uh, Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. And here's the tender aspect of relating to your wife, that every son needs to see his dad do, and every daughter needs to see his dad do with her mother. The word feed is life-giving is the idea. Uh, we call it self, a woman's self-esteem or self-image. And a man goes a long way towards building that in his wife. Or rather, it's really kind of reinforcing and shaping is how I think about that. And then care, uh, the idea means to warm, like warming biscuits in an oven. Uh, but in, in practical relational terms, it means to cherish something. To cherish something. To communicate that your girl is, is the most important person in your life, and even more important than success, or money, or, or your time. And my kids need to see that, those two things. Um, when I was young, I wish I could go back and sit at my dining room table with my dad there. And say, you know, Dad, as I look back on our growing up years, I so wish I had heard things like, with the five of us, my brother and sister, uh, you know, kids, uh, hang on a second. Your mother just said something very important. Honey, honey, say that again. I wish I'd heard that. I don't ever remember hearing that. Or... You know, sweetheart, I, I don't understand what you just said, but I want to. Try me again. Try this knucklehead again. I don't think I remember seeing that. Uh, you know, Dad, in my life as a young husband, uh, I, there were, I don't know how many times I had to ask Mindy's forgiveness for being harsh. I don't know if I ever saw you do that with Mom. I wish I had. I remember some times of you and mom arguing. There was some kind of miscommunication. I wish you'd said, you know, honey, I, I don't think I was very clear. I'm so sorry about that. Dad, I think that would have helped me. Um, Dad, it appeared to me growing up that you always seemed to have it together. At least that was my impression. And in my life as a husband and a father, I rarely feel like I have it together. It feels like I'm always behind the eight ball, and there are always things for me to learn. And, and even coming in here this morning, I was kind of dragging my, my soul behind me. And I so wish that I had known that that was normal. I, I wish you'd been able to tell me that. I think that would have helped me. There's something of that here um, with our fathers. They show us what matters, why it matters. And their presence communicates that. Now, I'd like to take just the rest of our time here and just sort of do a, I'm, I just turned 69 years old. I've been doing the ministry for, I don't know how many, you know, four decades, more than that. And I have talked to a lot of um, children Teenagers, husbands, and wives over the many years. And I'd, I'd like to try to just sort of come at it more from, you know, what, what, have, I, what have I observed uh, in people? Um, the idea of what, what's missing when a husband is not, when a father's not in the home could probably fill a book. You could probably write a hundred chapters on this. But I just, I, because of time, I just want to mention four. The first, children need to see their fathers because a father provides a sense of security. 
And I don't mean financial security uh, or, or a roof over the head, but there's some, some kind of security that goes on that the children yearn for down in their hearts. In, in one sense, I think of this as the word HOME in all caps. HOME is where I'm secure. Uh, Proverbs 23 says, listen to your father who gave you life, and he's saying more than just your father was a sperm donor, who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Dis Proverbs 19.8, discipline your son, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. Now, in our particular culture, I mentioned that parental love has gotten beaten down to any two people, really doesn't even need a father anymore, and maternal love, that's what's really needed, that's, that's the jewel. And I have known many uh, single mothers, and, we, and man, we've had some gems in our church, and still do, uh, and you know who you are, uh, and uh, uh, just amazing people, given the knucklehead husbands that left them. But there's something about security that's more than just mom loves me and dad loves me. That's just kind of the beginning. What kids really want is they want mom and dad to love each other every day and to see that and to experience that and to feel that. That makes them secure. There's something in their soul that can rest that can relax, that doesn't have to be anxious about the difficulties of life. Uh, I'm often asked, um, uh, Seth, can you, can you talk, uh, help me understand, uh, we're about to break up, we're about to divorce, and, and I, can you tell me how to tell my children or sort of give them the news gently? And, and this is sort of like asking, um, Nuclear fallout is about to happen, and, and can, you, can you give me some ideas as to how I can tell my children about how to, to deal with this? What I am profoundly aware of is that the way children think about this and the way adults think about this are categorically different. You'll hear a parent tell their child hundreds of times, oh, your mother loves you. And I will always love you. And your father loves you. And your father will always love you. It's just that we, just, we have a hard time loving each other as husband and wife. As if that's going to be the answer to the problem of the, 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 the uh, ache or the vacuum in the heart. And it is certainly not. But that's how parents think. That's not how children think. Children are shattered by this. Now, they may not tell you this, whether they are in elementary school or whether they are teenagers or whether they are young adults, but they are shattered. Why won't they tell you? Because they have been so shattered that they wonder what else could happen. If the mom-dad relationship is broken up, what gives me any sense that, that in my world... I'm going to be safe from other catastrophes like this. Now, they won't tell you that because to voice that to you, they intuitively know it risks this getting worse. So what do they do? They blame themselves because they don't want you to think that I think it's your fault, dad, or your fault, mom, or both of you, out of risk, the loss of risk, or the risk of losing even more. The second reason they say, uh, that they will say, well, I just blame, if only I'd been a better kid, if only I'd been more obedient. Why do they do that? They do that because that is less painful than opening the door to what they fear the most, and that is abandonment. If dad, or mom is not in the house, what goes, in, goes on in a child's soul? I've been abandoned. Now, it may not make cognitive sense to them. It's not going to make cognitive sense to children. It's certainly not going to make cognitive sense to teenagers. It's even hard to make cognitive sense of that when you're in your 20s or 30s. 
that, that fear of rejection that, that seems to be right outside your door and wants to knock on your door. And that, that fear of abandonment that wants to, is so painful that to ward off that pain, they will, well, if I had just been a better son or if I had just been a better daughter. That's how children think. That's what goes on in their soul. You can tell them a hundred thousand times it's not their fault. And that's not going to be the salve they need for your soul. Security. The second thing is identity. Honor your father and mother, Exodus 20, verse 12 says, that your days may be long in the land your God is giving you. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. 1 Timothy 3, 4. He must see that his children obey him with proper respect. Now, what the verses on parenting sort of imply or lead to is a deeper reality, and that is this. When a child grows up in your home, they form their identity invisibly. They do it by trial and error and by observation. They take in everything they see and hear, and their minds are constantly drawing conclusions. Sons are drawing the conclusions of what does it mean to be male? What does it mean to be a boy? What does it mean to be a man? Daughters are, what does it mean to be a girl? What does it mean to be a female or a young teen girl? And the way that those questions are answered primarily is by watching dad and mom, relating to dad, relating to mom, and particularly watching them relate to one another. And children slowly learn sort of how the, the wonder of gender is supposed to work and how a man is supposed to relate to a woman and not the knucklehead ways we typically do without this kind of instruction or how women expect husbands to relate to them without, again, proper instruction by watching a mother who does this well. Um, identity. Uh, when I think about this, uh, this thing of identity, uh, I'm reminded that, uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, <clears throat> and personally speaking, uh, boys tend to be pretty wild. And, um, and what they need is sort of to be corralled, or how to have that wildness sort of brought into <clears throat> some type of control and usefulness, sort of like a stallion out on the range that is corralled with a rope and brought back to the corral. And, and the, the horse then becomes useful for many different purposes. And boys are sort of like that. And, and when it comes to uh, corralling uh, young boys um, for single mothers, again, I know some spectacular single, single mothers that have been in our church. But if you have a teenage boy, you know this gets harder and harder and harder to do. What happens when a boy doesn't learn how to control his desires and his passions? And let's wildness go. Well, in our particular culture, that ends up in some kind of violence or some kind of sexual behavior that's going to cause trouble. When I think about this idea of identity with daughters, I think about every young daughter wants to be a princess to her father. She puts on her gown and her, her um, tiara, and she comes in as a little three old, look, daddy, watch me, watch me, watch me dance. And what she hopes is that she can bond with you and that you will see something of her beauty, and there'll be a smile on your face, and there's something that connects and engages with her soul, and just from, from the look on your face, your enjoyment of your daughter. An identity is forming about who I am as a girl and how to relate to a man. <clears throat> when I think about my, my father, I think about, you know, Dad, when I, when I live my life, um, it's, it's, it, there's some ways it's very challenging. And I, I saw you do the work thing really well. But um, how to do the work thing and the school thing? I wish I'd seen that. I, I wish you'd sat down with me and done algebra. I wish you'd sat down with my sister when she enjoyed art and did some watercolors with her or some paint by number. I, I wish you'd taken my, my little brother out to play golf more often. Uh, I wish I'd seen how to manage your work and relate to your children. And how to handle finances 
I only remember one thing about finances, and that is when I was a teenager, uh, you were at the dining room table. Tax rates were extremely high during this time of life in the 60s. My dad made good money, but a good chunk of it went off to the tax man. And, and Dad, I remember, and, th and this really did help me, you sitting at the dining room table with a stack of bills and throwing them up in the air, and they're all fluttering down. And I remember walking up to you and saying, Dad, what are you doing? And, and your response was, was, was helpful to me. The ones that land face up, I'll pay today. <laughs> How do you manage finances and work and your children and the responsibilities of the home, the chores? And I wish I'd seen you deal with that with mom. That always seems to be a, a tough thing to, to manage all the things. I feel like I'm perpetually behind with this, uh, and like I'm trying to, to put all this together from scratch, you know, starting almost 43 years ago. And I don't think you and I ever talked about temptations of a man. And what has to happen in order to not give in to those? I wish we'd had that discussion. Even one. Identity. The third item is strength. Strength. When uh, King David is on his deathbed, he talks to Solomon, who's about to become king, and his, his one-sentence summary that he passes on to Solomon is be strong and show yourself a man. What David understands is you are about to take on uh, a life as king, also as a husband and father, and it's going to require more of you than you think you have to give. Get used to it. Strength. There's a particular kind of strength. I think about every child wants to, wants to think of their dad. They think of their dad differently than the mother. You want to think of your dad as an anchor or as a rock. I always looked at my dad as a rock. Uh, that there was something uh, formidable there, something that was stable that I could always count on. Um, something of a shelter in the midst of the storms of life. And I guess, in summary, I guess I wish I would have seen him use his strength to build our home. I think he left most of that to my mother. The last thing I'd say is the, is the idea of a model. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you sit up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Well, my, the time when my kids are at home obviously is gone. And some days, someday I'm going to switch chairs. And someday I'm going to sit in my father's chair. And someday my son and my two daughters are going to sit in this stool. And they're going to have the same talk with me that I just had with my dad. And I wonder what they'll say. Will they say, Dad, I wish I'd seen you and Mom uh, disagree more often. And how to do that when you do disagree. Uh, I, I wish you'd talked about the budget more and sort of how do you make that work when, when there's differences of opinion about, about the budget. I don't think I remember seeing you and mom have conflict that much. It seemed like whenever you did, you sort of, that was sort of hidden for, you know, for, for some other place at some other time. I, I think I'm having to kind of scratch that together on my own. Um, I hope they'll say, I, I watched you and mom when you disagreed or when there was a misunderstanding and miscommunication, of which we have had many. And I got to see sort of how you, how you did that or how you tried to undo that, that mess. I hope they'll say, I watched you love mom, the woman that she is, and not nitpick her with her weaknesses and always point out where she's wrong. I rarely saw you try to fix one of her emotions or how she felt about a situation. 
And, glad I, and Dad, I'm glad I saw that. I hope that's what they'll say. This chair is inescapable. All of you men, if you're a father, will someday sit in this chair. You have a chance now to decide what's going to be the tenor or the nature of our conversation someday with my adult children. Every father who has any kind of sense of, of uh, how he's doing always feels like he could be doing more. I just told one of the guys as we were getting ready this morning that I, I never made up to my own standards as a father, let alone God's standards. I always seem to be behind. And yet, that's normal, it seems to me, talking to men. And I, I, I love the two verses on the back of your handout that speak to this. This is not a surprise to God. Proverbs 24, 16. A righteous man falls down seven times and gets up. That's normal is the idea here. It's the wicked man that throws in the towel and says, I'm out. Getting up again and again and again off the mat. And then Isaiah 32, the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. By noble deeds he stands. What's inescapable about fatherhood? There is a hunger in every child for a father. Sometimes it's felt like an ache. Sometimes it's something uh, 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 mysterious, or, or there's something missing, or, or something needs to be added to my soul, and I can't quite figure out what that is. But it's a person. It's a father. And again, when I think of this, I think of home, cap, all caps, H-O-M-E, where there is both shelter and warmth, where there is an anchor that I can always go home to and have this sense of safety where my soul can just relax. I can be at peace. I can be at rest. There's a respite here from the storms of life. My father has tried to build something wondrous that I can watch, that is bigger than me, but of which I am privileged to be a part as a son or a daughter. Well, there's a poem that was written a number of years ago by Edgar Guest, and I'd like to finish with this, this poem. It's a remarkable poem. Um, <clears throat> He starts off, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example, always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds, for to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it, if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action. Your tongue, too fast, may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true. But I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give. But there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. And he finishes with this stanza. One good man teaches many. Men believe what they behold. One deed of kindness noticed is worth 40 that are told. Who stands with men of honor learns to hold his honor dear. I love that line. He who stands with men of honor learns to hold his honor Dear, for right living speaks a language which to everyone should hear. Though an able speaker charms him with his eloquence, I say I'd rather see a sermon than merely hear one today. Let's pray together.
Father, I pray for all of us who are fathers, whether we're still at it with children at home or children in the womb or whether our children are out of the nest. Whether they are at home or out of the nest, there is still a role to be a father. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear the inner heart, the inner soul of our children? And to be men of understanding who, who, who understand our children, or at least seek to understand them, and to come alongside of them, and to provide them an example by how we live. And as we finished, Lord, this, this is, we, there'll always be a time when we could be doing better. There's no question about that. But that really is not the point. The point is to keep going the best we can and trusting ourselves to you and asking that you would use sometimes what seems like our futile efforts to build something wondrous and strong in our home and in my marriage and provide that kind of home, even if my kids are out of it now, that when they come home, there's something different. Perhaps uh, as, we, as we close in just a few moments, maybe you're like my dad who at age 55 looked back with horror on his years in his 20s and 30s and 40s. And he told me, Seth, I, I was really out to be a big shot. I was chasing the admiration of my peers and the, and the almighty dollar success. And he started all over again at age 55, being a husband and being a father. But what allowed him to do well his last seven years before he died of cancer was he came to Christ in a real way, a relational way, not, not just a theoretical, theological way. With a prayer something like this, God, you know, and I know that I am a sinner. I have missed some of the most important ways of life. And I have no excuses. And I come to you humbly and ask you to forgive me to wash me of the, the, the demons that I've chased and to help me re, renew, uh, make, make me a new man and, and make me a new husband and a new father to my three children. And God took him at his word there, that simple prayer of asking Jesus into his life. And my dad's life began to change. Over the next seven years, as my dad sat in our metaphorical chair up here, more and more he had something of value to tell me. Maybe that's where you are this morning. I say this to you to give you hope. It's not too late. As we surrender ourselves to God, God can do wondrous things with us if we will let him. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.